Russia is the largest country on the planet. It straddles nine time zones, possesses half of the world's nuclear warheads, and it's the largest energy producer. But Russia is not the former Soviet Union. As third-term president, Vladimir Putin flexes his muscles at home and abroad. Can Russia be a superpower once again? This is him. Welcome to Empire, I am Marwan Bishara. Since the Cold War ended two decades ago, the new emerging Russia has been largely defined by two men, Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin. Yeltsin presided over the dismemberment of the old Soviet Union and the reckless privatization of the state's assets. Complicit in this decade-long Russian underhaul stood Western powers, eager to transform their old nemesis into a new ally. Washington saw this chaotic free-for-all as a new Wild West and assisted the plunder. Deepening inequality, mounting insecurity and disorder put a damper on the economic liberalization and increased the popular demand for security, stability, and the rule of the law. To regulate the heist and limit the damage, a new brand of centralization through authoritarianism and populist nationalism was introduced to Russia by the Yeltsin clique in 1999. Some call it Putinism. Vladimir Putin is not a man you'd describe as subtle. The once and future Russian president wants to convey one message and one message only. Vladimir Putin equals power. He's an athlete, master of martial arts. He rides a bike, he's multi-skilled, like our country. So he is as well. Multi-skilled, positive, very handsome, and we simply love him. But lest you think these carefully orchestrated photo ops are merely a vanity project, they're not entirely lost at sea. Putin sees the Russian presidency as a metonym for the entire country. In other words, when you think of Russia, he wants you to think of this. Not this. The Yeltsin days may be long gone, but Putin knows the same problems still exist. While Russia does boast massive reserves of natural gas, coal and oil, that's only good news when energy prices soar because the economy is dangerously unbalanced. A massive 70% of all exports come from energy sources or minerals, meaning the country is at the mercy of global commodities markets. Just as alarming, the Russian people are dying off at a staggering rate. Male life expectancy is a mere 59, and at this rate, Russia is set to lose 50 million people in the next 40 years. So it's no wonder Putin does everything he can to eliminate the impression of weakness. It also explains why he has never had any apparent qualms in crushing internal rebellion, which tries to challenge the power of the country. Hopes rose late last year of a newfound momentum for democratic reform. The campaign is only starting. We, Yabloko, are announcing a campaign for the constitutional and lawful dismissal of the Putin group from power. Critics of the Kremlin now openly describe political life in Russia as sovereign democracy a curious state of affairs in which all the trappings of a democratic nation are readily apparent, but they exist purely to mask a fully functioning autocracy. I come out onto the street and see totally different things from what I'm told on TV, and that's it. For one thing, they've never believed Dmitry Medvedev to be the true leader of the nation. Critics look at the job swap with Vladimir Putin and see a puppet pretending to be president looked on with boredom by his master. But for the time being, Vladimir Putin doesn't give the impression he particularly cares. He's happy to continue this political marriage of convenience. He does what he wants, Medvedev does what he's told. 
One of the most vexing questions is how Putin has managed to weld together popular support with the institutions of state to create this domination of power. The single most effective way has been the threat of terrorist attack, whether it be real, fabricated, convenient, or a combination of the three. Major incidents like the Moscow theater siege in 2002 and the Beslan school siege in 2004 have left a powerful impression on the Russian people. These extremist attacks, among others, are what Putin and his supporters cite in order to justify his uncompromising approach to power. They believe it's not democracy that's under threat, it's Russia itself. I'm supporting Putin because he's the only one I can trust with my fatherland for my grandchildren and their children. We came here to congratulate him. We came to remind people that the Russian state has to be defended for it not to collapse, for it not to fall to pieces. If there's any doubt about Putin's commitment to this belief, just ask the Chechens. Putin's approach toward this breakaway republic has been entirely straightforward. He simply smashed it. Since 2007, Chechnya has been ruled by a former warlord hand-picked by the Kremlin, despite having fought against the Russians in the first Chechen war. And if anything, this partnership works a bit too well. During the election, one Chechen district awarded Putin a curious 107% of the vote, a fact no one in the Kremlin seems to mind. Me? What's more important is spectacle, consistency, and the projection of power. The rest has to wait. Joining me to discuss the state of play in Putin's Russia are Alex Pravda, lecturer and former director of the Russian and Eurasian Studies Center at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, and editor of Leading Russia, Putin in Perspective. And Andrew Wood, former British ambassador to Russia and co-author of Change or Decay, Russia's Dilemma and the West Response. And Edward Lucas, the international editor of The Economist and author of Deception, Spies Lies and How Russia Dupes the West. And last but not least, Alexander Nekrasov, journalist and former Kremlin advisor. Gentlemen, welcome to Empire. Alex, mm -hmm. let me start with you. Okay. Putinism, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? It means a construction of a clan network system of sharing wealth out among people in return for their subordinating themselves to power. It means a hierarchy of power. It means management of society <coughs> rather than politics of society. It means the avoidance of pluralism, the avoidance of conflict, because conflict is too risky for Russia. Order is the watchword, and order is the basis for his popularity, and he still retains that, largely not because he's delivered so well, but because the alternatives are far worse. And the alternatives are a picture of disorder, mayhem, chaos. Society in Russia never seems to trust itself sufficiently mm -hmm. to allow pluralism to bloom and to risk conflict and real politics. But after the Yeltsin years, perhaps a bit of authoritarianism is exactly what Russia needs? Well, Russia had authoritarianism under Yeltsin. It was a messy authoritarianism. It was an authoritarianism which didn't exist on a nicely coalesced set of agreements between those who were the tycoons on the one hand, who had the money and they were given business assets, and the politicians on the other. There was an uncertain relationship. Putin established, or rather re-established, the traditional Russian uh, setup, and that goes Soviet, pre-Soviet, that the state is the freeholder of assets, mm. business tycoons, aristocrats are leaseholders. And that's the agreement. And they serve their time, they do their bidding, they get the money. So he did that in a much more orderly fashion than Yeltsin. Edward, Putin a departure from Yeltsin or the extension of Yeltsin? I think Putin has his roots in the Yeltsin era, and although he likes now to say that the 1990s were a time of chaos and humiliation and all sorts of other bad things and Western interference and so on, we shouldn't forget that during these 1990s, he went from being an unemployed former secret policeman into being one of the most powerful men in Russia um, <coughs> via some very lucrative business deals and some very important government appointments. I think that we, in, the, in the 1990s, we saw the beginnings of election rigging, which has become elevated to an art form in mm. Russia now. We also saw, so, saw the, the resurrection of the old KGB under a new label, the growth in importance of the FSB, which is its domestic 
wing, particularly which Mr. Putin headed. That's now one of the great organs of power inside Russia, in, in a way, is the kind of chief enforcer for the regime. So I think there is continuity, but I think it's also made things worse. He made things worse. I think worse he, than the Yeltsin years. I think that the Yeltsin years were bad, chiefly because the oil price was very low. If Putin had had to deal with Yeltsin's oil price of below $20 a barrel, his record would be disastrous. If Yeltsin had had Putin's oil price of over $100 a barrel, we wouldn't look so harshly on Yeltsin. So he had this huge asset of high oil prices. Alexander? Putin years worse than the Yeltsin years? Well, the problem was that, and I was an advisor at the time, I was telling the Kremlin that there was a need to create a political system with a proper opposition, with proper institutions, and that's what Yeltsin didn't do. And I think that was the lasting damage that infi he inflicted on Russia. And Putin basically is the product of that system. It is not uh, a system where somebody a leader of a party gets up the party ladder and becomes popular or tries to become popular. It's just appointments, appointments, appointments. And that's why now we see that there are no political candidates that can actually stand in elections and have some weight or respect of the public. And um, that's another problem with the Russian opposition. There is no Russian opposition. These are all opportunists and chances who are trying to jump on the bandwagon. But why wagon. isn't there a Russian opposition? Is it the Russians' fault? Because, as I said, under the Yeltsin, opponents. there was no political system, crea a proper political system created. You have to have candidates for the presidency who would look respectable, who would be interesting, who would have a program. But nothing like that was... You see, Yeltsin was paranoid in the last years in power. He was paranoid. He didn't understand what was going on around him. His family was running things. So I think that is the result of what happened in the 90s we see now. Are you talking more about the so-called managed democracy? That means that you have to create the political system from to the top down? We didn't have any democracy under Yeltsin. It was a staged managed democracy. It was, uh, okay, it, it had a bit of change because we had some sort of a parliament debate. Critics uh, were saying that the president did, didn't do his job well. But in reality, the real power still lay with the Kremlin. They did what they wanted, and Yeltsin was part of it. Don't forget, Yeltsin was a uh, member of the Politburo of the mm -hmm. Soviet uh, Communist Party. He had that mentality of a Soviet politician. And um, I don't think he actually delivered on any of the promises he made. Do you get the sense that perhaps then Putin is a bit of a melange between Yeltsin and the Soviet era? Well, two things. No, nobody springs fully armed out of, uh, as if they were not part of history in, one, in that sense, of course. Um, I think we ought to be a bit careful about how much of the difficulties of the 90s we attribute to Yeltsin personally, mm. and also how uh, little respect we pay to the amount of evolution and development which actually did take place under his, his watch. The first liberal reforms introduced, economic reforms introduced under uh, Putin stemmed directly from the aspirations of the reformers under Yeltsin. There were more possibilities under Yeltsin of uh, developing a federal system which would work than have evolved under Putin. And I think the appearance of strength that we see in, in uh, the Putin system up until the very recent past was an illusion. A key to Putin's present uh, dominance is the difficulty in seeing alternative is also a, um, an accusation, if you like. He's not coming in for a new term. Effectively, he's coming in for a fourth term. The one word we haven't mentioned here is corruption. And um, you asked Alex what's the definition <coughs> of Putin Putinism. And he gave a very good political definition. But I think there's also a kind of business definition, which is that the people who run Russia also own it. And this is an elite which, over the past 10 years, has managed to steal tens of billions of dollars in natural resource rents and in bureaucratic rents, bureaucratic rents being a fancy word for, for, for bribes. And this is obviously has its roots in the Yeltsin era when things were also corrupt and we had the scandals about loans for shares and so on. But this has intensified and grown to an absolutely extraordinary extent under Putin. And it's a really big question for me now whether that business model is sustainable. It seems to me it's, it's dependent on a high and rising oil price because this bribe control, bribe sucking machine needs to be fed more and more every year. So it's impossibly a source of instability now, whereas it was a sort of source of stability earlier when they had more goodies to hand out. But why do I get the feeling that whenever we talk about Yeltsin, we talk about reform, and when we talk about Putin, we talk about corruption? I mean, 
I think we should get away from personalization. I mean, Russia is, of course, a highly personalized system. Alex, can you, can you escape personalization? Yes, I think we can, because if you look at, look at the Soviet history of mm. politics, and we don't go back to Tsarist times, but these are individuals grappling with fantastically difficult problems. The fundamental problem is this. If you want to keep together as one state, such a disparate and large territory, underpopulated in the East for most of it, and the decision was made to keep even the North Caucasus, that could have been actually allowed to float into international mandate responsibility. We wouldn't have wanted Chechnya and Cohen thrown onto our response. But he decided to keep it, and Yeltsin decided to keep it, integral territorial integrity. If you do that, you are almost fating yourself to having a top-down system. And the experiments under Yeltsin of allowing the region's elections and so on didn't work. There's not the confidence to allow democracy and parties to be formed from below. So the notion of something coming from below and the notion of a loyal opposition is absent from Russian political traditions. It's just not there. So you think but Putin is, is a political so necessity? Putin, so Putin is trying to manage this given the basic requisites of keeping Russia together, which he and his clique have, have uh, pushed as unquestionable principles. If you decide to really decentralize the country and risk the chaos of democracy, then you could change Russia. I emphatically do not agree that Russia is incapable of a federal structure. Not incapable, very, very difficult. Very difficult, but then so is democracy, it is in fact authoritarianism. It's yes. not that easy either. Mm. Um, it seems to me that uh, under Yeltsin there were the possible beginnings of a federal structure, and the first thing that Putin did was to destroy that. Uh, it needed, obviously, enforcing the, the departure of those governors who had been elected earlier uh, and whose terms had expired, and there was, would have required a great deal of will, but nonetheless, there was at least the flexible possibility of a greater degree of federalism, which is necessary for Russia. I think to uh, be too seduced by the idea that he's kept on to Chechnya, for example, is, is uh, uh, rather dangerous. It's a Chechnya without Russians. But you see, the question is why, when there was a de facto independent Chechnya in the 90s, wasn't Chechnya let go? Let go? You think yeah. they would let go like the other former not? republics of the Soviet Union? They're a drag economically, in security terms. Well, maybe that was a good thing, maybe it was a well, bad Chechnya thing. Chechnya was against the written republic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let sorry, them go on that. the international system. But well, take you, you couldn't allow such a, such a uh, s situation develop in the Caucasus. We would have, been, we would have had an all-out war there. So, so yeah, did, so did, two all out no, so no, did Putin, I mean all out did Putin teach everyone a lesson with Chechnya, simply that? It was just a question of timing, and Putin has just become prime minister, and he decided well, he's kind of won he's going to teach he's, everyone he's a lesson. He's won the battles, but he's lost the war, I yes. think, in that he has cracked down very hard on the visible manifestations of separatism. And so you now have Kadyrov and other regional leaders who play total lip service to Putin, but I actually think that he's, he's actually weakened the long-term prospects of keeping, keeping <coughs> Russia together by this kind of centralization and personalization and absence of real institutions. You have this bunch of incredibly rich people who control the money and the power at the top and who are detested um, yeah, in the regions. They have to dole out money and goodies and other things to try and keep, keep people loyal. But I think you, and you've also seen the migration of Russians out of a lot of these regions, which used to be quite mixed with ethnic Russians and other people. And the eth ethnic Russians have been moving in large numbers out of, out of, out of the North Caucasus, with the result that it now, in, in a way, is not really part of the Russian Federation, except it's not, it's not subject to the Russian Constitution, it's not subject to the Russian rule of law. All it really has is a kind of military um, modus vivendi, way of living with the Russian Federation, but it's not more than that. Uh, Alexander, do you think, hearing all of this, you think Putin is on the rise or is he on the decline, regardless of the election results? I think that, uh, first of all, all Western academics, experts on Russia miss one point, a very important one. Our country lived under communism for 75 mm. years, the most aggressive form of communism imaginable. You must understand, this is poison which goes into the system. To cleanse the system, you need decades. You cannot just come like Yeltsin and say, that's it. <coughs> Let's forget about communism. It's capitalism now. Didn't work. And it wouldn't work. And that's why I think that both Yeltsin and Putin are temporary figures. I know it's taking a long time, but in my estimate, it would probably take another 10 years for the generation change to happen and real changes start to happen. Second point, the West played a very, very negative role 
in the Russian development in these 20 years. If you see where the money is hidden, which was stolen from Russia, it is hidden in the West. Mm -hmm. And when I hear all, all those stories how the West wanted to help Russia change into a democratic state, I say rubbish. The West <coughs> proved to be an obstacle. I was an advisor in the Kremlin, and we had 120 foreign advisors, mm -hmm. Americans, Brits, a couple of Germans. It was the Washington Consensus time. But they were all horrible. Their advice was terrible. Liberalization at and, any and, cost. And, and this sort of jump into privatization, mm -hmm. I was against it. I was saying this is going to end in disaster. So all these oligarchs who were created, you know who was advising them? Westerners, mm -hmm. Western bankers, Western lawyers. And they were telling them how to hide that money on offshore accounts and so on. And when I hear now, you know, some Western experts saying, well, they didn't do that properly, they didn't do that properly. I always say to them, give us our money back first, and yeah. then you tell us what to do. I, I agree with you absolutely. There was an enormous amount of Western naive optimism naive. about the tr you naive. naive offshore yes. accounts. Prim there was a search looking for a new panacea, a new formula which would actually solve everything at one, at one shot. And that was capitalism, liberal democracy, full marketization. Nobody, nobody thought like full that. Full marketization. That, that was, was the imposed answer. on the Kremlin by those advisors. Could we say there was a uh, Russian role and the West was complicit? There was always a split in the Kremlin yeah. between the pro Westerners, like mm. it was always in Russia, and the people who said, let's take it slowly, let's not rush mm. into these yeah. things. But Mara, I think it's, it's, it, we're getting back into this familiar argument about who made what mistakes in the 1990s. And sure, there is plenty of blame to go around, but the fact is it, it's 10 years since the 1990s, it's more than 10 years since the 1990s. Putin, in that period, has had unlimited money and unlimited power. If he'd said, I want all Russians to wear blue hats and orange trousers for the good of the country, they'd have done it. And then look what happened. $1.3 trillion in excess oil and gas revenues have gone. Not invested, just gone. Wasted, stolen. That's not there. Okay with the complicity of the West, but the point for Russia is, what happens now? Where's this machine going? It's running, it's running on empty. It doesn't have that huge dividend of public trust anymore. It doesn't have the huge dividend of the oil and gas revenue. So what's, what's he going to do? And I think that's what we should be looking at. What Edward is saying basically is that there's a system of patronage where you know, they were putting in his buddies on the top. But could he have, like for example during the common system, tell people, the bureaucrats, not to steal? <coughs> the system is necessarily corrupt. Because, um, after all, if you are somewhere in the, in the feeding chain, you see that your boss pays no attention to the law, you're not going to either. This is a fundamental weakness of the regime, and it's a fundamental reason why there were a, so, such a large degree of protests uh, towards the end of this past year. Well, Those protests yeah. were tiny. Yeah. Nobody supports them across Maybe, the country. But, if you take these the are, these are but we haven't seen this before over the last yes, 10 years. Okay, so they happen, but these are tiny groups of people. They have no support things across start, the country, none. Things I'm start in small ways, and the main that. point of the protest was in, in the indignation at the arrogance of power. Is, is there a Russian spring on the... No, that's a wrong analogy. Yes. But there's the beginnings of a... Of a the new middle class, we've all been waiting for for years, is beginning to show a degree of self-respect <coughs> and saying to politicians, don't be as arrogant, don't be as dismissive of us. People are fed up with politics. And we're going to be looking at that when we come back after a news break. <music> Welcome back with my guests, Alexander Nekrasov, Edward Lucas, Alex Pravda, and Andrew Wood. The Cold War is hardly behind us, yet there is talk of a new Cold War with the Middle East as one of its familiar battlegrounds. The Kremlin has warned against what it terms Washington's destabilizing foreign policy, and Putin has publicly accused the West of interfering in Russian internal affairs and claims his re-election by almost a two-third majority as a victory against Russian foreign and domestic enemies alike. As he prepares to take over the Kremlin for the third time, there is no telling what Putin is thinking. Will he raise the anti-American rhetoric or pursue a more pragmatic course with Washington? Either way, the post-Cold War honeymoon has given way to a new geopolitical clash of interests reminiscent 